What's up, college football fans and Mean Green fans? Sonoy Valente here once again with the Mean Green Show. And today I'm joined by the one and only Matthew Bruni. And before we get into everything related to Matt and what he's got cooking for us, uh, you guys already know the drill. If you're a fan of college football, college football recruiting, G5 football, the transfer portal, or any of the above, consider hitting that like and subscribe button because that is all that we talk about. All right, Matt, we're in, uh, what's the day today? July mid late july july 19th I'm, july 19th yeah i'm on summer brain so uh, <laughs> the days are kind of irrelevant to me right now yeah, um, but man how um how's this summer going for you i mean i know you're busy doing a lot of things but you know catch us up on, on what you've been up to a little bit yeah no there there hasn't been there hasn't been too much change um, i'm staying with i'm with my parents right now in san antonio until fall camp basically starts up um in august so just trying to Wait it out, feel it out, and uh, you know these. This, this is like my vacation couple weeks. You know, the the first few weeks of July are like my vacation weeks of the year. You know, I try to take take some time myself. I figure full time people and like you know upper level people of every level have some time off. So I was like, you know, just give myself a couple couple weeks off here to to relax and enjoy my summer instead of just constantly being bombarded. And you know, North Texas has. Uh, hasn't had like this sl slew of transfers or or uh, commits rather and so i've had a little bit of free time so i've been able to relax for once so it's been kind of nice yeah you're on your sabbatical and yeah north texas yeah, maybe, maybe that's why north texas is doing that just for you because uh they, they know you work hard and they're I telling so. all of our our four-star guys not to sign until until matthew gets uh you know gets yeah. a breather gets a kick yeah. his feet up and then we'll then we'll let the floodgates open Exactly. Uh, just, just wait a little bit. Just yeah, wait just wait a little bit. August <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, so, you know, at the end of this, you know, we'll get into some fan questions that people have sent me and, uh, you know, we got some fun ones for you, obviously. And but yeah, I wonder what they're about. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder, right. <laughs> Matthew McGregor. But uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so anyway, I kind of want to ask you a few questions about, you know, some of the positions and, and I'll, I'll frame it up and, you know, we won't beat all of them to death, but just kind of want us like some quick, if you had to say, just name who you think, you know, the guy is or guys are, and, you know, we'll expound a little bit on, on some of the positions and some of them, maybe not too much, but okay. Two headed question. First one out the gates, who's QB one going into Northwestern state and, or who is QB one going into SMU? QB one going into Northwestern state is going to be, Austin Ani, Austin Ani, week one, uh, going into week two, it's going to be, man, it's going to be Jace Reuter. It's official. Okay, guys, it's it's a hundred percent official now. Ani week one, Reuter week two. I think okay. both of them play. Both of them play week one. I think both of them have good showings, and I think Jace Reuter um, shows that he's farther along than maybe the coaches expected. And Austin Ani is probably what he was last year, a good player. But I'm going to roll Jace Reuter week two, if not week three at latest. Okay, so, there we go. So it could be it could be a week three situation where, like last year, where Jason Bean, uh, you know, had the reps, had the reps, and then he went up against SMU, and you're like, oh, Jason Bean cannot play against SMU, and they put Austin Ani, and he at least showed he's capable. Like it could be that situation. Not com not saying Austin Ani is Jason Bean from last year, but you know, you get the comparison. Definitely not. Those might be fighting words, depending on who you ask. <laughs> um, but. No, in all seriousness, though, so you you anticipate Reuter getting some snaps with the ones against Northwestern State, for sure. Yeah, I've heard everything. I, everything everything I've heard is is he looks really good, okay. uh, just in their summer workouts and their summer stuff. Like, I I see no reason in which he's not a serious serious com competitor to Ani in fall camp. Now, whether mm -hmm. he catches Ani in fall camp, I can't say, and I don't know. But everything I've heard is that he's he's good. He's very yeah. good. Yeah, so. yeah, that's that's exciting to hear. And, you know, touching on Ani a little bit more, um, one, he is not a leather shoe. He is, yeah, he, Ani, I mean, I was high on Ani uh, yeah. this past season. Not saying I'm not high on him anymore, but I mean, I even talked with, you know, Miles at N NTSN at one yeah. point. I thought he had, I mean, I was thinking he might be able to outdo Mason Fine. Like, I know that sounds outlandish now, but that's how high I was on him at one point. And, you know, obviously all the pro football focus, everything has him in the top tier in the nation. So, out of you know, I, I being optimistic. Worst case scenario, it's Asanani, and there is that is not the worst boat to be in. Nope. You, you know, like I, you know, I think 
Austin's a very capable QB that could surprise us nevertheless, but I agree. Um, I, I do agree. I do agree with that. I think he, he's going to take a step forward. Um, if he is the starter, I, I, for me, it has to be a, I don't want to say a big step forward, but it has to be a substantial enough step forward to where he is completing more percentage of his passes, uh, making the right reads in different situations, being able to um, complete different, uh, different types of passes and because last year it felt very formulaic in a lot of ways with Jalen Darden. And I mean, obviously Jalen Darden is Jalen Darden, but even other than that, it felt like if it wasn't Jalen Darden, it was a shot down the field, you know, or if it was maybe a 10 yard out and stuff like that. Um, it just didn't feel like the offense had enough variance to it. And I just want whoever the quarterback is to add that variance, to add that, um, you know, kind of unpredictability innocent because if there's one thing this offense has been the last two years, I think it's been predictable. To yeah. A degree. Yeah. Okay. Who is tied in one and who is tied in two? I'm going Jake Roberts tied in one tied in two is a really, really tough question. And I feel like the safe answer would be Jason Pearl just because I think that just experience and I would hope that he is able to beat out all these younger guys who he's five years older than almost or four years older than. But if not Pirtle, I'm going to roll Asher Alberting. Okay. Man, that, that's such a tough room to, yeah. to decipher. You have Asher Alberting, Varkis Gums is a super high rated player, Christian Lee, Khatib Lyles. Um, but I'll, I'll say Jason Pirtle as, as tied into just because I, I think yeah. they can play him in a different, in different areas. They can put him in the slot receiver wise. Um, and they can put him in tight as tight end. Uh, but I'm a Jake Roberts one, Jason Pirtle two for me. Yeah. And, and piggybacking off of that, I, you know, I think Jason Pirtle, again, kind of like Ani, like worst case scenario, we got Pirtle, you, you know, like, I mean, he's very, you know, knows the offense, veteran presence and all that. And, you know, he may not be the uh, fly off the handle athlete that maybe Varquez might be, or, you know, yeah. we think and hope that he'll be, or even um, the receiving threat that Jake Roberts appears that he's going to be. But, you know, at the end of the day, you know, he's a, you know, what was he a preseason all conference last year tied in? I mean, what, you know, whatever. He, he was, he was, he was yeah. last year. When that came out last year, I was yeah. even like, what is happening here? <laughs> who who <laughs> runs that stuff? I feel like the conference USA guys, all right, guys, we got to come up with ours. Like, who's all been right, this right. stuff the longest? Let's just throw some names. Up. Yeah. yeah, he yeah. had like 20 receptions the year before and like four touchdowns. Give it to him. Give it to <laughs> yeah, him. Yeah, yeah. Let's just throw, throw some right. names on the wall. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and and talking a little bit more on the on the tight end room, do you think we'll see Varkis? And would you like to? I mean, a, do you think we will? B, would you like to see Varkis get a lot of playing time against Northwestern State, assuming we're up substantially in that game? Yeah, I, I would love to see Varkis just because I think he has the like Jair shorter potential with him, and even if he's like the tight end version of Jair shorter, I think he has that like potential just with his size, his athleticism. I mean a big time recruit coming out. I, I could already see him. I don't want to say I could see him surpassing some of the guys in that room, but they are, they are definitely, he is his athleticism and his raw talent is going to be something that is going to put him in position to play early on. So, mm -hmm. um, Hatib Lyles was also a highly rated guy. So I'm, I still have hope for him. I think he could do very well at H back or tight end, wherever they put him, but Varkis gums, I would expect to get playing time in that first game. And, you know, maybe, in a game or two here and there. I mean, with, with the red shirt rule, yeah. you know, you can play a few games. So um, I wouldn't be surprised to see him early and, you know, in a couple of games this season. Yeah. Yeah. I think the the fan and a lot of us just, you know, they want to see him in the mix and, you know, I'd like to see him get some targets in that Northwestern game. And even if it, it doesn't go well, I just see that, you know, just, I just think the upside with him is, you know, has the potential to be pretty, pretty great yeah yeah and, and it's like that way it's like that way for you know every team who gets high rate of recruits it's like that way for every pro team who drafts a rookie that you know might be like the buccaneers of Jalen dar and you see a lot of fans like oh Jalen Darren's gonna yeah uh, it's gonna be really fun i want to i want to see him and stuff so you, you know players want to see those new players like we want to see bryce drummond out there we want to see um a lot of different gabe blair we want to see zig little mcmillan and guys like that so that's natural and um i'm I think, but I do think he's one of the freshmen that has a really, really good chance of playing early on. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Who's wide receiver one? 
you had to guess right now. Jair Shorter. Jair, Jair Shorter. Shorter, okay. Jair Shorter. I'm going to roll with him. I'm going to say he's 100%. He's, um, from everything I've, I've heard, he's 100%. And if that's the case, I, I'm taking him over Deontay Simpson. I'm, I mean, I'm taking him over Lorenzo Thompson. Um, T- Tommy Bush, I'm taking him over still at this moment. And, yeah, I think he's – he, I think he's – while you think Tommy he gets Bush, more than a thousand receiving yards this season? No, no, okay. I don't know. If, I don't know if anybody gets over a thousand receiving mm-hmm. yards, and that that's a good thing to me, yeah. because I that would assume that Tommy Bush and Deontay Simpson are both solid players, like mm-hmm. or at the very least solid players. Mm-hmm. So if we can distribute that between Deontay, Tommy, Jair, and then some of the other guys in the receiving room, and maybe even get Jake Roberts in in the mix for for you know hundred or two hundred yards, then. Then we're looking at a at a you know a team that has a very distributed passing attack that you know whoever the quarterback is can start making um, having different options and having starting to spread the ball around and I think that will lead to a more dynamic offense in my opinion. So um, they have the receivers to do it. I'm going to take Jair Shorter though as my receiver one. Very good, very good. Okay amongst the conference you know 14 teams where do you think our o-line ranks amongst those 14 the hard thing is obviously i don't know every single team's offensive line however right. it's I so do hard know, to like gauge O line yeah but the, the thing i do know is what an average offensive line looks like in conference usa and i know that before last year north texas was well below that average standard like if, if I just said the seventh ranked team in, in my head is what I know it looks like every year. Like, like I know UAB's top half offensive line, something mm-hmm. like that. Like, like I know what it should look like. And last year was the first year where it looked like an average to above average offensive line. This year, going off that scale, I'm going to say fifth. I'm going to say fifth, rank fifth offensive line wise. And I think that's... Very, very good, and I think that is might might even be a step up from last year. And again, that's just based off the standard that Conference USA has year in year out. And that you know Marshall sets with UAB sets with who all those other you know big teams set every year. Um, I'll, I'll say fifth, assuming that it's a normal year for Conference USA, and I think that's a really uh, consistent step forward that this team has needed for a uh, long time. Because you know you look at this the recruiting trail the past few years and it's been offensive line i don't say offensive line heavy but it's been it's received it's gotten some top end offensive linemen and you know chris cassidy jet duncan gabe blair bunch yeah. of guys so i'm hearing yeah. really good things about gabe blair too for what it's worth i mean everybody yeah I'm seemingly talked to and raves about gabe blair so gabe blair is a dude to look out for this year for sure yeah and i was just to um talk a little bit more about Gabe Blair. And I, I don't really know if this is the right term because I, I'm a personal believer in like for athletes, if you red chart, that's a good thing. It's just an extra year of school for you. It's an extra year yeah. to try to go to the next level. If that's, you know, something that you think you're capable of doing. So for lack of a better term, do you think Gabe Blair avoids red shirting this year though? Do you think he, he plays up more than four? Like, I don't think they'll need him to, mm-hmm. but if they needed him to, he definitely can. Like yeah. I, I'm hearing he could be one of the like he might be like the third or fourth best interior offensive lineman. Wow! Like immediately, so like a solid already. number two guy, possibly. Yeah, like a really, really good backup. Like that's wow. what we could be talking about. So they wow. might not need him. Yeah, but if they need to slide him in for let's say Jet Duncan days on yeah. Carroll or someone like that, I we're I don't think you'll see a drop off. Yeah. Just from I'm I'm. Here and he might be the best freshman of the group already. Wow. Like he's having wow. really, really good years. Um, and that's from like a couple people. Like yeah. around. So I'm just like, okay, like okay, my my expectations are high for him. So I, even if he's just a solid, solid backup his first year on campus, that's a huge deal. Mm-hmm. And unless if it's unless if they desperately need him, obviously I think they're gonna want to redshirt him. Mm-hmm. Um, but we'll see how it goes and how it plays, but Gabe Blair is is the dude who's stood out already in summer camp. Um, so be, be on the lookout for him. Okay. And what are your expectations for Oscar Attaway this year? And how much do you think the offense will need to be featured around him, if at all? I think the offense definitely needs to be featured around him. I think 
with this offensive line, I think there's a good chance that we see them run the ball as much as they have in years past, but maybe get a little more dynamic in the run game. Um, maybe they can start rushing it on downs, but maybe they didn't before, whether that's maybe a second and six situation, whether that's a, like, you know, those, those in between situations where you can pass or run. I felt like they've always favored the pass and understandably. So there might be situations where you can just turn and hand to Oscar and get a first down from a second and seven. Like there, there might be times like that where th- with this offensive line and Oscar right away is your running back. I think there is going to be times where he surprises us with what he can do and what the run game can do for this team. And um, I, like I said, I think the percentage wise, it's going to be the same as it has in years before, whether that's 60, 40, 55, 45 pass. I don't, I don't expect that to change. I just think that the ways that they're going to be able to run the ball and the effectiveness of how they're going to be able to run the ball is going to be, is going to be improved. And I think that's going to help open up the pass game. That's another reason why I'm not, I'm not, I, I can see Austin Ani holding mm-hmm. on to the job for a bit is because I think the run game is going to be better than it has been in since probably DeAndre Torrey's first year, which was 2018. I think mm-hmm. that was so. Um, yeah. So I, I have high expectations from Attaway offensive line. And I think the run game is going to be like, I I've said this on, on our podcast before, um on Bruni's breakdown podcast is you know I have some questions about the quarterback position I have some questions about the receiver positions not to say that those aren't talented groups but we know what we're getting from Oscar Attaway and we know what we're getting from the offensive line so in theory that should be the safe bet here is the safe bet is saying that Oscar Attaway in the run game is going to be able to I don't want to say carve up but have really good years have really good games this year yeah yeah, man. And and then, you know, if, if that is the case, then whoever's QB1, I mean, you know, maybe they don't have to pass for 300 plus to, to win us the game. Maybe, you know, they just got to come yeah. in there and kind of manage things and, you, yeah. know, you know, pick up just a few few first downs here and there and, you, and, you know, a lot of play action. So hopefully that's, you know, that's our our road to success and we can ride that. Yeah, a surprisingly good year. Yeah, and and Austin Ani was was good in the play action pass. I mean, we saw those play pro football focus and all those stats and everything. Love him in the play action game, which is understandable because um, a, a lot of the big plays that North Texas has, even when Mason Fine was here, were off the play action. Like it's ha- fake handoff to J- Jeffrey Wilson, turn around, take a shot deep to Jalen Guyton. Like that's the type of offense that uh, South Trail always has. So. Um, Play action passes is going to be a big part of this offense again, and hopefully the run game is good enough to really, really open it up down the field. Okay, and then switching things over to the defense just as a whole, where do you think we will rank in the conference this year defensively? And by, by chance, do you know where we ranked in the conference last year? I, I, I know it was very low. I think it was 13. I mean, it was basically last in almost every statistical category. Yeah. Because yeah. ultimately you didn't play last year. So 13th or 14th. One of the two. It was, yeah, it was basically last last year. Yeah. Um, I always say that they were they were the 127th rush defense out of 128 teams, I think it was. Uh, pass defense wasn't much better. Statistically speaking, they were one of the worst offenses in college football. I, for my... I, I always just say that they were the worst defense in college football last year, just to make it easier, just mm-hmm. to be like, oh yeah, they were the worst offense defense in, conference, uh, in college football last year, so they can only get better. Um, now you ask where do they, where you think, where I think they're going to rank in, in Conference USA this year? Um, man, I, Conference USA is going to have some defenses, and that's what it, they always feel like they have some defenses. They always have defense and running backs. That's what Conference USA always seems like it has to a degree. Uh, Rice, UAB, Marshall, UTSA. Then you get like Southern Miss, La Tech, um, FAU, FIU. Even I'm going to say, let's just, let's just be optimist here. And let's say (laughs) it's not going to sound optimistic when I say it, but (laughs) let's be optimist here. And let's say they come in ninth. Okay. Ninth. I I think that's pretty damn good. I think that's a a great improvement. Like that's, and I've said on, on the podcast before, uh, they didn't. They need to make a giant stride forward. Like they need to go from again last in college college football, 128th to 100th, and that might not seem like a giant step forward, but that really, really would be like mm-hmm. it, 100th out of 128th instead of 128th out of 128th is such a 
major step forward for this defense. And I, it's very attainable. I think it's attainable, attainable goal, but it's going to require this team to be a lot better because I was going back and listening to old podcasts. I was driving uh, the other day and I was just like, Oh, let me just go listen to old pod, uh, some of our old podcasts on Bernie's breakdown. And cause a lot of them are funny to listen back to just be like, Oh man, I remember just suffering through that and just being like, yeah, and, you know, good times. So, and I l- listened to the Appalachian state game and obviously that was just, what a what a what a yeah. performance that was and just the the anger the disappointment and everything in my voice and in Colin's voice and it's just like this is what it's been all year it's like it's been terrible and so at a certain point it has to turn around and I think that this is the group to get them back as a top you know 100 defense in, mm-hmm. in the country which yeah Again, isn't an incredibly high standard, but it's a standard that I think will make a huge, huge. Yeah. You, you'll be able to tell, yeah. right? You'll be able to yeah. tell. That's that's just what it is. What yeah. it is. If they're cap- If they're competent. Mm-hmm. Okay, moving things over to the schedule. Do you think UAB or La Tech, like we've got to win at least one of those games in order to essentially save the season or keep the season going? Because you know, it's Northwestern State, then at SMU, then UAB, then at La Tech, then Missouri. So, I mean, if we lost to, to UAB and La Tech, it's very likely to think we'll go into Marshall at one and four. Yeah. You know, um, how much can you, and, and again, Marshall, you know, what were they ranked as high as what, like 13th or 18th, 15th? Yeah. They were good last year. Marshall and, and Liberty, yeah, back to back. Yeah. And they're, yeah, Marshall and Liberty back to back. They're both ranked within the top 20. You know, so I mean, you yeah. Know, I mean, no, what is that you know, going into Rice at one and six without a win? Uh, you, you know, I mean, can we resurrect? But anyway, okay. Do you think UAB or La Tech is a must win? Every, well, we have to win one. I do. Uh, yes, yes, a hundred percent, one hundred percent. One of those has to be a win. Um, you could throw Marshall in that group and say they need to win at least one of those, if not two of those mm-hmm. three. Um, because the goal of this team is obviously to make a bowl game. It's six and six. Mm-hmm. And while a lot of people want to write off, like I was reading through different predictions for the schedule and, you know, some of them are low, some of them are high on, on North Texas. Um, but one of them that had North Texas going six and six had them going, I think they had them beating, uh, Northwestern state, Louisiana tech, and then winning those four games in a row after, Liberty, which is um, you in no particular order, UTEP, FIU, Rice, and Southern Miss. Mm-hmm. So that that's out of order, but yeah, those four games, and I think that's that's a that is a doable four game stretch. But winning all four of those in a row, if you have lost, yeah. if you come into that at what would they come in at two and five? Yeah, like that's asking a lot. Yeah, that's that's just asking a lot of of a team that has yeah. a really really tough schedule. So if they can. If they can get two of the first six of the of that five game stretch or of that six game stretch, I'm sorry, then we're looking at this team very, very differently. And we're looking at them at three and four instead of two and five. Mm -hmm. And I don't in my head, that's just a huge difference. Yeah, because while they can win those four games in a row, Rice is going to be predicted to be better than them uh, entering the season. Southern Miss is going to be on their level, if not a little better. Uh, UTEP is going to have its best team and probably i don't even know like five years six years something like that and not saying that they're gonna be better than north texas but you know they'll be mm-hmm. you know they'll be a team and yeah. UTEP almost beat north texas last year let's not forget that yeah. like it's, yeah. it was a good game uh and fiu should be better so it's gonna be a i don't think that you can just bank on those four games as being wins like i don't mm-hmm. see that you have to get wins other places as well mm-hmm. whether that's marshall whether that's uab la tech uh, even UTSA at the end, if you want to throw that them in there, you have to get wins other places. You can't just rely on those four games in Northwestern and then hoping to sneak another one out to me. You have to get, you have to earn a substantial win that mm. people aren't expecting. Okay. And just to make sure this question is clear, I'm not asking, do you think we are better than UAB? Because I mean, they've been coming off a conference championship. That's not what I'm asking. I'm just asking, do you think our roster is more talented than UAB? And like, so what I'm generally trying to say is like, do you think we have the talent to surprise a lot of people, a lot of conference teams as far as like the UAB, the law text, just from like the, how well, you know, Seth Luttrell has recruited the last couple of years. 
do you think that we have do you think we're more talented like i mean star power yeah. ratings all that do you think we're more talented than uab i i, I do but uab is always just UAB. So mm -hmm. it's tough to, you know, count them out. I will say I'm starting to come around on this North Texas team and that might just be summer workouts and everything. Just yeah. being in my ear, like, wow, this guy yeah. looks great. Wow. This guy looks great. That's probably what it is, but I'm starting are to undefeated around. right now. <laughs> <laughs> like I'm starting to come around and I know I shouldn't be coming around on this team that just looked awful last year, but Hey, I'm starting to come around. So maybe in my head, I'm starting because last in my head, I was always at like four and eight, five and seven mm -hmm. with this team, just without making a prediction. I was just in my head. I'm at four and eight, five and seven. And as the year approaches, I'm looking at it and like La Tech, UAB are two teams who are going to be good. UAB better than La Tech, uh, according just to preseason polls and everything like that, preseason predictions, all that stuff. Everyone says UAB is going to be better than La Tech. So if you can beat La Tech, then you go UAB Marshall. And while they're both good, they're not as good as they were last year. Mm -hmm. Marshall, you know, is going to be good. They're both going to be, should be better than North Texas, but mm -hmm. they're not like these juggernaut teams. Yeah. You win one of those. You're looking at three and four. Then you go into that four game stretch in UTSA to, to wrap it up. You win three of those five. You're looking at six and six year. You're looking at a bowl game. You make a bowl game. You at, with six wins, they're not going to put you against Utah State, who's top number, you know, twenty five in the country. Hopefully, we hope not. And <laughs> you know, it's a it's a it's a winnable game. Yeah. You win that one, you're seven and six. Everybody's happy. Yeah. You go into the future and yeah. just you know start winning conference championships after that, right? That's like right. that. That's the, the dynasty. Goal. That's yeah. the goal. Um, I know that's a long tangent from all your question asked was if you're more talented from if North yeah. Texas is more talented than from UAB than UAB. But all that to say I'm becoming more optimistic in the team, and a lot of that is because the sheer amount of talent on the team. So yes, I do think they are more talented. Yeah. Than UAB. Who knows? Maybe we go into SMU and they don't have their quarterback situation figured out and we still a win. I'm not saying I think we are, but what if we do? We could go into Missouri uh, yeah. at four and zero. Oh. Yeah, like, I, I love how high I love how high your your voice. Yeah, you said, Maybe we I can get up there it. in the falsetto. That, that, that's where it's like. That's where you have to start convincing yourself. Like, yeah. oh, there's a chance. I don't know. Like, maybe yeah, I don't know. They got like these gets four, COVID and like, yeah, they, like, they got like these four and five star like transfers in the portal. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe they, maybe they, yeah, who knows? <laughs> maybe they can't read the playbook. Um, <laughs> but um, anyway, so, okay. So in other words, law tech might be the biggest game of Seth Luttrell's era. <laughs> it might, might be turned out to that might, I could make or break him potentially. Yeah. Um, it feels like every game of this season will be like the Super Bowl of, of UNT of just like, we have to like, you, got, you know, if we lost the last one, we got to win the next one. Um, yeah. But it'll it'll be fun. You yeah. know, why you know, why do you believe going back to recruit recruitment? Um, what, you know, what do you believe why, or why do you believe that things have been so quiet on the recruiting end for North Texas? I, I know you said something about we have like significantly less scholarships this year or something, or I think I saw you, you tweeting about that maybe, but um, but do you have any you have anything you can share with us, any whispers of of recruits they're talking to or um or or again any idea of why it's been so quiet? Yeah, um, basically, and I actually learned this through the Wake Forest coach. So, I mean, for anybody who followed me on Twitter, I did some Wake Forest stuff in the past month. And Wake, Wake Forest head football coach Dave Clawson was actually an oppressor. And um, someone asked him about the whole COVID year situation where everybody gets their year back and so on and how that impacts the team and stuff like that. And he made the point. And this was probably two months ago at this point. He made the point that after this year, because, you know, everybody could come back this year. Mm -hmm. After this year, they're going back. College football is going back to 85 scholarships. Like, so you don't get. And what are what going back to 85 from? And what is it at currently like? I think, I mean, it was at 85, I believe. Or I mean, okay. well, it's 85, but the super seniors don't count towards that. Okay, okay, okay. So DeAndre Torrey doesn't count towards that. Um, okay. You know, Tyreek Davis doesn't count towards that. But next year, super seniors will count towards that. Okay. So in theory, let's say, oh, uh, what, Katie Davis. Mm -hmm. Katie Davis going into, I think, his 
would be se- senior year, but mm-hmm. he still has the option to come back for next year because of the COVID year. Right. He would count towards the 85 man scholarship at that gotcha. point. Gotcha. Gotcha. And so that's where teams are in a pickle because they're like, okay. And this is what the Dave Clawson said basically is that you're going to come to a situation where teams that teams are going to have to start deciding between do we sign freshmen and transfers or do we, or do we sign freshmen and transfers? And then, you know, might have to have some players leave from the program, you know, might have to like, for lack of a better word, they might have to like cut some players, right. Mm -hmm. To make room for these freshmen and transfers or, you know, tell the super seniors be like, Hey, we don't have spots for you. You know what I mean? Uh, so do you do that or do you just roll with the super seniors and just sign less players? Yeah. You know, that's where the, the tough situation is for these coaches. And that's why I think North Texas is going slowly because there is going, there is a lot of unknown right now. There's, there's this unknown throughout college football is that will these players come back? Will they feel like, you know, since we got our senior season, um, we're happy, you know, we'll, we'll go on. Um, nobody knows. Mm -hmm. So that's why North Texas is being slower than other teams because they're really taking a patient approach because a lot of these teams you see out here, I think Marshall has 20 commits at this point already, something Mm -hmm. like that. If they have a good amount of players come back for a super senior season, like let's say they have 10 super seniors come back, right? They're going to have 10 less scholarships. Yeah that so so then you're like weighing like uh do we tell the super seniors not to come back do we you know what do we do and so that's the situation that i'm very i've become very very intrigued and whenever wake forest coach whenever the wake forest coach said that i was just like whoa that is something i had not thought about yeah and so that's what i think north texas is going through right now it's like okay because you look at the junior the juniors on this team i I don't have the roster in front of me but right it is guys like kd davis yeah talented players i think jire shorter is going to i mean but he acted at an actual no he didn't have a record yeah. i don't yeah. know but you know guys like that basically it's like yeah. you don't want to chase them off for oh no freshmen so no. that's that's the tough situation um i i uh anticipate them it picking up you know at some point uh i would anticipate closer to november but um it's going to be interesting, but that that's yeah. the whole rundown of what I understand with from the Wake Forest coach and from everything I'm hearing from just North Texas and just people around college football. It's like that's why there's a little bit of hesitancy, and that's why you could start to see players, whether it's decommit or enter the, or you'd be like, whoa, that guy's in the transfer portal. Maybe that's mm-hmm. what happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, it's a real big cause and effect with all that super mm-hmm. senior stuff and kind of bittersweet on, you know, depending on. How you yeah. look at it. Um, all right. Are you ready to get into, into some questions? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. All right. Our first one is from Oscar Alvarez. He says, uh, or his question is, had Cade Renfro stayed in the 20 class, do you think he would have gotten an opportunity last year as a true freshman? That's a great question. Um, Cause I love, I mean, Cade Renfro, Cade Renfro is a very talented player. Mm-hmm. Uh, went to an SEC school, obviously. I think he is now walking on at Arkansas, if I'm not mistaken. Everyone was like, you know, why not just go G5 and you know, yeah. probably start? Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I think there is a there is a circumstance, and there there was a chance there would have been a chance last year for him to play. I don't know if they would have started him because I I see him. I couldn't have seen him being better than Austin Ani last year. Yeah. So I don't think uh, they would have played him over Austin Ani, but maybe you know, give him some reps here and there um in blowouts uh who knows but i don't think he would have garnered substantial snaps last year or he and i don't think he would have been in the competition with those other two so i could see him like you know case and martin level last year and case and martin is you know he's a fine quarterback yeah. oh yeah so. for sure all right this next one is from ryan Payne. It's a bit of a bit of a novel let me let me go ahead and make sure i get this one right okay it says um or he's saying, do you feel like our football social media accounts are lacking when it comes to putting out promotional content? I see other Conference USA schools being very active when it comes to this component. Also, I feel as if we have a lot more to show off than some others in our conference. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I, get, I guess I get, I get what he's saying there. I mean, you know, I do see a, a, other schools put promotional videos and stuff out. And well, yeah, what are your thoughts on that? 
Um, so, I mean, for anyone who followed the the team, uh, basically they're they are I don't know how to word it. Their PR guy, basically their SID, is now working with Conference USA. So they've been working to hire a new one, and they did hire a new one um, this past the uh, like past week. So that should help. Um, I know they had a little bit of movement there. Um, I, I do think it is weird that they haven't had as much posted as other teams, just as far as promo video. I mean, just summer workout stuff. Usually they're really good on and it hasn't been as sharp as, or has, hasn't been as much as I think we would hope. Um, why that is, I don't know how much of that is tied to um, Jordan step going to conference USA or Jordan step um, leaving. Um, but I think that would play a factor. However, they still have video guys that, you know, are paid and work, but, you know, maybe they're on vacation. Maybe they take their vacation days during the summer, obviously. Um, I don't know. I, I don't know exactly why. I would say that their social media is not as engaging, at least as far as this summer goes. It hasn't been as engaging as other ones that I've looked at. You know, I've followed working for the Texas Tech and Wake Forest sites. I've been able to follow their stuff and, um, they're posting a lot yeah. on there. So, you know, it, it is something that I think they need to look at. And I think that they need to just post more of because while social media, so the social media game to me, while it is some quality, a lot of it is just quantity. You have to keep people engaged. You have to keep people like, oh yeah, North Texas, this North Texas, that like, oh, this is a cool photo of Oscar Attaway. This is, uh, you know, Oscar Attaway benching 300 pounds. Oh, that I, I won't get tired of that. That's really yeah. cool. Yeah. DeAndre Corey squatting a thousand pounds. That's yeah. cool to me. Like yeah. just get the, get the chains on him and stuff like the Derrick Henry workouts. And yeah. Just, oh yeah. Do Absolutely. It. So anyways, yeah, I, I just, I think that there is some room to, to improve there as far as this summer's goes. I'm not going to say the whole year or mm. anything like that has been bad, but I think this summer it's been a little slow. So mm -hmm. why that is exactly, I don't know. Gotcha. Jacob Huggins, our next question. Um, do you know if the football team will be getting an upgraded locker room anytime soon? I believe that's in the master plan, and I believe that's the next thing. So if, shameless plug, uh, I interviewed Ren Baker, and that is on our YouTube page, Mingering 24-7. Um, and we talked about the master plan and everything, and he said, obviously, it will step back a year from the COVID. Um, but the first thing that they are focused on is expanding the uh, the athletic um, facility or the athletic center, the athletic center, yeah, uh, where it has all the offices, all the weight rooms, and below that, below the weight room, like there's stairs, and you get to the locker room. And so I am assumed that, or I assume that that includes the locker room because that is basically a part of the athletic center. So um, I would assume that being in the master plan, uh, in the plan that will pick back up this year. And I believe, I mean, that comes with an expanded weight room that comes with a lot of uh, meeting rooms, you know? So I, I don't see why that wouldn't include the locker room. So, yeah, yeah, that's, that's interesting, you know, and uh, I guess, cause that was probably like one of the few things we're lacking on as far as the, you know, competing with other teams at the conference is probably the locker room. I would say, um, not that ours is horrible, but, um, some other teams, you know, they may not have as nice of a stadium, but it seems like they have a pretty nice locker room. Um, mm -hmm. So and that's where, you yeah. know, the recruits take a lot of pictures, you know, yeah, might sound silly, but that's, no, that's the reality. Sure. Sure. And North Texas has, has devoted a lot of money to facilities around North Texas with this master plan. So I think it's safe to say that the locker room is something that is going to get a facelift pretty soon. Yeah. Interesting. All right. This next one is from Ed. Colopy, Colopy. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry if I'm missing that name up. Um, his question is: Any thoughts of not taking so many home run swings with the offense in order to become more consistent, moving the chains? So this was a problem early, early, or not early last year, but probably the first half of last year. I went. I don't remember what podcast it was last year, but we would talk about this all the time, just in how you know the whole Austin Ani's only throwing bombs to Jair shorter he's only throwing it you know 40 yard routes the 50 yard you know bombs that's what it felt like all the time or it was like a little J Jalen Darden screen it felt like there was no in between um especially for the early part of last year I think as the season progressed I think the quarterback and the offense developed a little bit more intermediate game but I do think the intermediate game is going to be very important for this team because 
while Jaya Shorter and Tommy Bush can take tops, and a lot of players on this uh, receiving court can take the top off defense, it's going to be replacing Jalen Darden's production in the intermediate and short game. And whether that, I don't think you can, and I don't think you can just throw wide receiver screens to, you know, fill in the blank here, whoever, and expect them to pop for 10 yards like Jalen Darden did. You might have to get more creative. You might have to figure out more different, you might have to figure out different concepts to open up these routes in the middle of the field. But I do think using the middle of the field, using the intermediate to short five to 15 range is going to be pivotal for this team going forward. And the quarterback's going to have to obviously make those throws on time on target in order for this offense to continue to move the chains. Because I, I agree that last year, and as I said, last year, it became a little too predictable. It felt like it was boomer bust a lot of times. And that's what it's felt like the past two years, really even with Mason fine, um, it felt like it was all all or nothing. And so I would love consistency. There were flashes of, con- of consistency last year. However, I don't think it was sustained because, you know, at times they were just hoping Jalen Darn popped one. And a lot of times he did. So you don't have Jalen Darn this year. You have a lot of good receivers. I want to see more var- variants and I want to see more, you know, just consistency, I think overall. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's that's a great question and you pretty much yeah that's a good, that's a good question it. yeah um all right so why we're all truly here at the end of the day <laughs> um <laughs> dude we gotta we gotta we, I, I i really want to pick your brain I, and i've got so many questions literally probably 80 percent of the i can't name off everybody 80 percent of the questions, questions were about this probably oh yeah, my gosh like, so yeah, yeah like like this is all I'm known for at this point. I do. This is this is this is your make or break, man. <laughs> <laughs> Kyla Powell. Who knew? You know, we had uh, our UNT version of McGregor and Mayweather, and two keyboard kings. You know, going at it, and uh, man, that was. So I'll just kind of I'm just gonna kind of meatball the, all the questions. Yeah, go together. ahead. Your so, questions, um, their questions, all of it. Yeah, you know. So how how did that? Okay, so what? he said something and then you were just like, screw it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like if UNT is not going to get a recruit, I'm going to do something here. And you like, how did that even like, like uh, transpire into what it was? I mean, what was the, the, cause I feel like, I mean, I don't know, but I, I, how did, how did that happen? I guess essentially. Yeah. So first again, shameless plug. Sorry, piggyback two sided question. This is from somebody people literally ask, was the whole thing staged? So if you can answer those two questions. <laughs> Shameless plug. If you haven't listened to the podcast, Brunus Barrington podcast, I had him on that night. Yeah. I, uh, he DM'd me first, um, just like a gif basically. Yeah. And then I was like, I was like, when you come in on the podcast, he said, when, when, when you want, and I said 20 minutes, he said, yeah, we just hopped on zoom. Um, to answer the questions, but yeah, check out the podcast. That was for a lot yeah. of fun. Yeah, um, oh, it was. <laughs> to answer the question, it, it was not staged. It was not staged at all. I can see how somebody would think that just because of how quickly we got on podcast. Yeah, like, that was quick. Kind of resolved it. Like that's, I wasn't expecting that. So I can see why someone would think that. It was not staged though. He actually came at me last year about something about Asher Alberting. Um, I wrote that he was flirting with the defensive end, uh, you know, other side of the ball. And he called me out on that. And and whatnot and so that annoyed me this year um he called me he called me out on austin ani and i all i said in the tweet basically was that austin ani needs to be better like i think he needs to be significantly better than he was last year and he quoted me and and said uh made made some just baseless accusations that i was taking that i took credit for jacob brammer's uh, uh success and that um tyreek davis uh doesn't play linebacker anymore which didn't really bother me, but it was the fact that I think we had already had history. We don't follow each other. Yeah. So he found this tweet and I, I said this on the podcast, but basically I've always kind of just gone back on gone. Like I've had no problem firing back at people on Twitter because a lot of times it's like for fun for me. Yeah. It's a yeah. lot of fun. Just, you know, you, oh, you think you could talk smack yeah. to me? Yeah, I'm going to fire right back at you. So I was just like, all right, give me a second. Because I was like, <laughs> Kyla Powell, man, this dude doesn't play. Like, come on, this. what are we doing here? And yeah. so I typed it up. I said, 
oh, oh no. Or I said something like, oh, damn, this is the dude that literally only started playing when they when UNT played running backs at <laughs> linebacker. <laughs> and as he said on the podcast, it caught him off guard. I think it yeah. caught everybody off guard. Yeah, it yeah. caught me off guard. <laughs> like, it caught everybody off guard with just how, like, like I, it, was, it was mean, how yeah. mean that was. And so, but I was tired of it. So then yeah. we just started going back and forth. Um <laughs> And just kept going at it and at it. I, I said, I'll have my, I'll pay him fifteen dollars to come on my podcast, a dollar <laughs> for every solo tackle he's made in his career. Like we <laughs> were just going at it, at it, at it. And you know, he had some good retorts oh, yeah. as well. Uh, so that's that made it a lot of fun. And um, but no, it was not staged. I was genuinely like upset at him, and mm-hmm. I was like, no, this like, no, screw this dude. Like I'm I'm going at him. We're going at it. And so we ended up getting on podcast and I already knew how I wanted to handle it on the podcast. Like I had an idea and I knew we were going to be able to talk and you know, we weren't going to like just start yelling at each other. Like, yeah, it's not that serious. Um, so we get on there and I, I make it, I make it fun with the whole intro and everything. And we just start talking. And, um, I think, I think it turned out pretty well, but it was, it was, it was a lot of fun. So I don't know how many questions that answered, but yeah, uh, yeah, you can keep going. <laughs> yeah, definitely. That was a lot of fun. And he, I mean, he, um, he did a great job on there. And I feel like even like, even kind of after y'all like, had y'all's little jabs and whatnot, he just talking football, like it was pretty informative. Like it was like, okay, right. like and that's, is- that's what, um, that's what it gets to is that. So his initial thing of saying that, you know, he said that he, he, his, to quote him, he said, this guy thinks that Cinco still plays linebacker. And he's talking about Tyreek Davis. Mm-hmm. Obviously last year, Tyreek Davis was a linebacker. This year I go to the spring game and he's lined up in the box and around the box and so you know i don't i think nothing's changed this is where me not going to spring practice and the covid thing and everything mm. hurts because i don't know who's changed what who and you don't have in person interviews and stuff like that and so that's why i tweeted at him like when are you going to come on the podcast and talk personnel and schematics because that's literally all i want now coaches aren't going to come on here for the most part and just be like oh yeah we're going to do this this and this and give you a depth chart rundown and everything that's why what he did was great and it's exactly what i wanted i wanted him to come on and be like oh tyree davis is the sam nickel corner now Mm -hmm. which is great because i didn't know that and i i told you last time on this podcast i just want to learn i just want to be informed so that way i don't sound stupid and so he told me that he went through a bunch of other depth chart positions. He basically went through the whole depth chart on defense, like on the podcast, which was great. Like Larry Nixon, K- um, Katie Davis, the Murphy brothers, Dion Noville, secondary wise. Like Gabe he went Blair, through all I mean, He mentioned Gabe Blair too. Yeah. yeah. He mentioned Gabe Blair on there. Like he went through the whole r- r- depth chart basically. And that's exactly what I wanted. Mm-hmm. But I know if you ask a player just to come on and be like, Hey, come on the podcast and we're going to just talk depth chart and this and that they're not going to do it. Mm -hmm. And Mm -hmm. so that's where it becomes tough in that. Like we do these podcasts kind of inferring because it's not guessing it's inferring based on what we know and based on what we've heard, but we can't be perfect at it. If Mm -hmm. we don't, if we're not in those meeting rooms, if we're not in, you know, talking to the position coaches every week, if we're not talking to them about what they're thinking, that's why what Clint Bowen did laugh for me last year talking off the record about stuff really helped me learn uh about that stuff but i hadn't had i've only talked to phil bitten once and it was like a 10 minute conversation and it was like Mm. first story and so that's where it's tough um but yeah i appreciate kyle coming on and you know breaking that down for me because that's basically exactly what i wanted yeah like if you're gonna tell me if you're gonna tell me that i'm i have it wrong come on podcast or or tell me what's right yeah so that's all i ever want and so i appreciate him him for doing that because that was but that, that was a lot of fun there. Yeah. And another question is, is will he be coming back on in the future? I see someone we could see back on. Would you like to have him back on? And sure, sure. Yeah. Um, you know, ho- um, you know, hopefully you can get some playing time this year. <laughs> and, uh, like, hey, I, we got round two coming up. <laughs> um, but yeah, you know, it, it, I wouldn't mind having him on. I don't think he's going to come on and just start talking depth chart again, though. That's yeah. the thing. It's like, that was like, yeah. he used the depth chart in a way to like, prove me wrong and to like disprove i guess what i was saying he didn't come on to try to educate the masses of like what north texas depth chart is Mm -hmm. and there's there's a difference in that so um yeah i'll I'll have him on probably at some point about some other stuff or you know talk talking through like some 
some wins or whatnot, but uh, cause he's, he's a good talker. He's a good interview. Yeah. But, oh yeah. You know, very well spoken. And but we'll see, There's, we'll see, how, we'll see how he does this year. Yeah. Um, okay. Here's another question. How, how much would it take for you to do an exhibition fight against Kyle Um, or, you know, maybe other UNT football players, whatever, but that's kind of interesting. Like, you know, like with all the NIL stuff that's going on or, um, you know, maybe like a, like a three minute, three round. So three, three minute rounds, headgear, <laughs> headgear, gloves three on minute rounds, three, three minute rounds. So nine minutes all maybe at tavern, maybe at public house. What, what would be, I mean, this person is asked like, what would be your number to get you in the ring? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you gotta, we gotta think about that's D one football players. Like, you know yeah. what I mean? Like they're, they're, they're in their prime. Like, how much is it going to take for if, if y'all listen to the podcast? You know, I'm like 5'8, yeah. 150 max. Yeah, max. Would you do it for and a grand? Would you go in there nine minutes? No, hell no, oh. no, <laughs> nope, nope, nope. I, I'm someone who doesn't value money like that. That's like, good. I'm not the person that's just like, oh man, I need to a thousand dollars. Think about yeah. it. My pride, my face, my body is worth more than a thousand dollars. I'm thinking. Now ten thousand, we'd start. Oh I'd, yeah, I'd, I'd, start, oh, dude. I'd start. I'd start considering it, man. Because ten thousand, yeah, I would do it two for ten. Yeah, ten, ten. I'd probably do it. I'm gonna say ten thousand is probably the number. Uh, Kyle Powell, ten thousand. That that. Yeah, sure. You know, it's. Yeah, I'm trying it's to think of your a face, player. You know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it'll fix up. It'll get. You don't better. need your face to write. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna. Sh- we're gonna show up to interviews like just black guy yeah. and just messed up face. Um, you know, at least you know. Ty, uh, I'm trying to think of a player. At least it's Kyle Powell and not like Dion Noville. Yeah, yeah, Dion Noville, like a defensive yeah. lineman or or an yeah. offensive lineman or something like that. Yeah, no, screw that. Um, no, I wouldn't take any any football player for for less than like eight eight thousand. Okay, I'm eight thousand is the number. All right, all right. I'm looking at it. I'm like, even like the small players, like Rod Burns. Oh yeah. <laughs> nah, he's he's got me. Just, I mean, I'm not gonna win any fight. It's just like yeah. surviving. Yeah, yeah, sure. Rod sure. Burns would still just three minute rounds. I'm not lasting that. Dude, yeah, also, that's, that's I, exhausting. I, I don't have boxing experience. I've actually been wanting this. You know, maybe takes uh, whether it's kickboxing oh, or something. What? Classy. Are we? Are you training? Are you training for the fight? Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> uh, yeah, I gotta start taking classes at some point. But oh I, man, no, on the horizon. I don't have I don't have any self defense um, skills in me, so <laughs> it would just be straight. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's it. Yeah. That's it. And, speaking and it of wouldn't like, be good. You know which player would you want to fight? You know, because think I mean from a size wise, Jalen Darden is not the biggest guy. He's you know smaller guy too. But can you imagine the stamina? The stamina and the lightning hands he probably has, the dude. I, oh my, dude, God. that would be a nightmare. Oh, like, I'd be terrified. I, I would. I think I'd, I don't. I would not want to do that. That'd be like getting in there with with like uh, a and mongoose. How like much bigger Jalen. Like maybe freshman year, sophomore year, Jalen Darden. But like Jalen Darden, junior senior or juniors. Yeah, like senior year. Like and even now, like I follow him on Instagram. This dude's yeah. big. Yeah, now. like, dude, like no, no, no way, no. man, no way. No. Um. That's interesting though. So we, that would be, I wonder how many people that would draw like, um, like a, a YouTubers, uh, podcaster versus, you, you know what I mean? A card I, always, of that. I always laugh at the YouTubers boxing. I'm like, yeah. this is just, I, I don't watch it. I just know yeah. what's going on. I'm just like, all right, y'all can enjoy this, whatever, but they are getting paid a lot of money. So, you know, I, I, I make, I laugh at them, but then I'm over here selling my, selling my body for $8,000. Yeah. I must, I'm a sellout. What I mean, really, what would you do if, if after this tavern message, you like, hey, we can we can get you sixty five hundred, like like sixty five hundred. <laughs> you come in, like you do three three rounds with uh you know, with, with Kylub and and I mean what? what, what <laughs> yeah, the crazy thing is that they 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 would never do this because I'm not that much of a draw. Yeah, and yeah. it would have to be like a higher end football player than Kylo Powell. Yeah, um, no offense to Kylo no. Powell. But I mean, yeah, actually, complete offense to Kyle Powell. Yeah, yeah, need, yeah. yeah. Hey, little, hype it up, man! Hype it up. We need, we need a little bit better of a player here. We need to throw <laughs> somebody in here uh, that's that's notable. But um, no, man. But that that's that's funny. That's uh, funny. I I would not go any rounds with anybody. Uh, I would get just destroyed, mauled. 
it'd be over in a second. Hey, they, if they knock you out, or then you know, in like two minutes, that's two that minutes would be and the you get your yeah, you know, first minute, just give me a clean shot, to like yeah. right here, yeah, and just, boom, send me to the ground, yeah. I wake up in like ten minutes, probably. Yeah, take your money. money. Go home. <laughs> yeah, take a punch for ten thousand okay. dollars. Absolutely, right. that's that interesting. Uh, well, all right, Matthew. Well, hey, you know, once again, thank you so much for coming on. And you know, one more time, or I don't think I'll let you even do it in the beginning. But where can people find you at? Um, my Twitter's right here uh, at Matthew Bruni underscore. Um, Mingering247.com is the 247 site. Uh, Bruni's Breakdown Podcast on Apple, on SoundCloud, Twitter. Um, you know, we post it all the time. And yeah, I'm pretty much done with Texas Tech and Wake Forest stuff. So North Texas fans can come on back for, uh, you know, their content yeah. For, yeah. For, we're, for a while, even though I'm on my sabbatical. Yeah, we're oh. sick of that that Tech and Wake Forest business. <laughs> um <laughs> But all right, Matt, you know, thanks again. Enjoy the rest of your summer. Looking forward to kicking things off this football season. Hopefully yeah. we have a surprisingly good year. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready for it, man. Thanks for having me. Absolutely.